class in here at one, but it is a huge pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Balch. She is an assistant professor at University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, she is also the university director of the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, um, which maybe she can tell all of you about a little bit, which is a new um, collaboration with USGS and her university selected to head this center. Um, and she is the director from the university side. Um, and I invited Jennifer, I put her name forward as a potential seminar speaker for a few reasons. Um, one is there's a lot of, there's a divide here in the forestry students of the tropical folks and the western folks who like to set fire to things. <laughs> Jennifer works on tropical forests and sets them on fire. Uh, and so I thought this is, this is the speaker that a lot of the MF students have been waiting to bring them all together. Um, but I also invited Jennifer because we overlap. So Jennifer did her bachelor's degree at Princeton and then came here to Yale FES to do her PhD um, with Lisa Curran and she finished in 2008. She then went on to a postdoctoral fellowship at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, which is where we overlap. And I've always been really impressed by Jennifer, both as a scientist and just as a really good human being. And so <laughs> that was another reason why I was excited to host her, because she's great to interact with. Um, for, <coughs> excuse me, for master's students, because I thought there would be interest, um, I left a time slot in her schedule from four, at four o'clock up in Marsh. So hopefully you all got that message if you have questions for her and for Doctoral students, I know there's a breakfast tomorrow morning at nine here in Croon, and so I just wanted to make sure you all had time to, to interact with Jennifer because she's a great role model. Um, I don't want to take any more of her time, but um, I'm excited to hear her talk. So thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Liza, and thank you, Karen, for inviting me out here. Um, so I did my PhD here. School of Forestry Environmental Studies. This, build, this building wasn't here when I was here. Um, and everything I'm going to present to you today, I, I want to give you a little bit of background context that there are two lessons I have learned in the process of being a scientist. One is that science is an imperfect process. So embrace what you don't know and be comfortable with not knowing. And I think there's a really wonderful reminder of that at Sage Hall, if you look at the lettering of that word environmental, uh, somebody made a mistake. Somebody made a mistake in tapping out that letter and had to go back and do it again. And I think that's a really important mental reminder, visual reminder of the fact that some of the best innovation actually comes from not knowing and sharing what you don't know with your colleagues. And so for every great idea I present here, I probably had at least a dozen failures getting to that process. Um, the other thing is that you have to have a thick skin. Science is a business of rejection. I didn't get into graduate school the first time I applied. So I was rejected from six different institutions. That could have been the end of my science career. And it was only that next year that I applied that I got in. So also I want you to know that if you hold on to your good ideas, you will be successful in science. So hang on to those as I kind of run through the gamut of the work that I do. So I'm a fire scientist, a fire ecologist. I study the diversity and distribution of fire on our planet and how fire is changing and what are the consequences. And mostly what I've been pushed into is this question of how are people changing fire regimes? So also in this process of being a fire scientist, we live in the data era. There are over a dozen satellites right now capturing information about fire and fire effects. And we are, every day I run into a data wall, a data or compute wall. And so I also started at CU Boulder Earth Lab, which is a data synthesis center for earth systems re research. And what we do is we help people get over data pain, data and compute pain, to get to the science questions that they want to get to. And I also direct the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, which is essentially how do we leverage the data revolution for resource management decisions? How do we actually bring the data insights and help resource managers make decisions about how we're going to adapt to a changing climate? OK. So that's a little bit about who I am. I consider people the fire species. And some of the earliest evidence for our relationship with fire comes from about a million years ago. 
um, in caves in South Africa where early hominid ancestors were using fire. Um, about 10,000 years ago, we started using fire to manage landscapes. And I would argue that today our addiction to combustion, so our combustion-dependent economy, is also playing out in how fire expresses itself in the landscape. And so I love this image of fire in a box. We've essentially put fire in a box, and our economies, there's a relationship between fossil fuel combustion and biomass burning on large global scales. So another important piece of context is that fire is changing. 2017 was the second largest and the most costly fire season that we've had on record. This is a picture of burned area um, in that year in the red and forest systems in the western US. And the trajectory of increasing burned area through time from the 1980s to today. And essentially what's happened is we've seen a 350% increase in fire in the western US and a 1,500% increase in fire in Western forest systems. So we have really good documented evidence that fire is changing, and there's also really good evidence that it's linked to a warming climate. There's been a two degree Fahrenheit increase across the Western US. We've essentially seen a very tightly close relationship between burned area and temperature increase and a drying of fuels. So we've seen 50% increase in burned area related to um, a 50% increase in the aridity of fuels. So that's the context. We also have extreme events. Some of those are related, some of those are not related to a changing climate. Um, but it's important to think about them in the context of we've got a backdrop of a warming world and we also have these extremes piled on. So in 2017, we saw the wettest winter. So these dark green and blue areas are areas that experienced the wettest recorded ever um, periods of time in that winter time frame. We also had the hottest summer temperatures also ever recorded in the summer following that winter. And then we had the driest falls ever recorded. Now these events are not linked to a changing climate per se, aside from the increased baselines in temperature. But what we do know is that this particular sequence is really important for fire. We've got um, an increase in fuels associated, very fine surface fuels associated with a really wet winter. They dry out during a really hot summer and then you've got an extended fire season that goes into the fall. And so this is the setup that we had for the Thomas Fire in California, in Southern California. Um, that at the time was the largest wildfire ever recorded in California's history, which was then blown away by last year's record around the Mendocino complex. And so we've seen these increases in fire activity that are very responsive to what is going on with climate. This is just a snapshot of the interviews that I've done over the last six months, and I get this question all the time. What caused this wildfire? Is it climate change? Is it people? Is it fuels? Megafire is more frequent because of climate change and forest management. Science says the warmer it is, the more fire we see. Behind most fire is a person and a spark. So it's a complicated mix of things that are going on to drive fire activity. And you can kind of bin them into these different buckets. So this is a rough outline of my talk. The questions I ask are what are the causes of changing fire? What are the consequences for ecosystems and for people, both in terms of climate? How is a changing climate affecting fire? How is fire itself changing the climate? How are fuels changing? How are ignitions changing? And then a little bit, I'm gonna talk about harnessing the fire data revolution. So some of the questions that I would not have been able to answer um, had we not been able to get over some of the data hurdles. And you're all at a really wonderful and unique moment in the history of science when you have access to all these incredible sources of information. I mean, think about it. It took Darwin an entire lifetime to collect the information that he needed in order to understand patterns of biodiversity. And now we can understand biodiversity from space. Right? So you have the potential to ask questions that wouldn't have even been possible. So I'll get into how, that, how the data revolution is affecting fire science. Okay, so ingredient number one. 
So I'm not going to talk about how um, a change in climate is affecting fire. I'm actually going to talk about how fire is influencing the climate system and through what I call the great fire experiment in tropical forests. So one of the key mechanisms for land use change is actually through the use of fire to convert forest systems um, into something else, pasture, agriculture. The record, the historical charcoal record, gives us some indication that tropical forests may have burned every several centuries under very extreme drought conditions. This is evidence the fir very first discovery of fire in tropical forests was a science paper in 1970 that documented charcoal um, from this southern part of Venezuela. Fast forward to today, where we are seeing fire rotations on the order of decades in certain regions. This is a, a MODIS image capturing 100,000 different fire detections and the smoke plume that's generated from those fires in the Amazon, carrying across six different countries, hitting Sao Paulo, crossing the ocean, and touching South, South Africa. So you've got huge teleconnections between what's going on in the Amazon and what's being experienced in terms of the smoke and emissions consequences of those fires. So this is a picture of a deforestation fire, essentially what um, the process is dragging down forests between like two giant tractors with a chain link um, between them, letting them dry out, and then burning them sequentially over time. And it's essentially fast respiration. It's a big pulse of carbon to the atmosphere um, because fire is essentially the opposite process of photosynthesis. And the Amazon's rapidly expanding frontier is not something we haven't seen before. And so I would argue that what we're seeing in the Amazon today is not unlike the process of frontier expansion in the US 200 years ago, where this image, which is taken from the 1880 census, is trying to capture a picture of what fire looked like in the eastern US at that time. And it's flipped from our conceptions of fire today, where we think about fire as a Western US problem. In the 1880s, it was actually an Eastern US problem related to rapid land, land cover change to fuel the ironworks industry, which was leaving forest canopies open, huge, huge amounts of fuel on the ground when they were actually vulnerable to fire. And it's important to contextualize our thinking about fire today um, in kind of this historical relationship that people have with fire and how we use fire in frontier landscapes. So projecting out fire risk in the Amazon to 2100, um, based on our knowledge of different infrastructure and land uses in the Amazon. Um, so going out to 2100, what you're seeing in the red pixels is the risk, mostly associated with, with road networks of what we expect fire risk to look like in the Amazon in the future. And Brazil is at a really interesting moment where it's um, conflicted between development and conservation. So the picture on the left, um, a, a group of soy producers deforesting a, a thousand hectare area through the use of fire so that they can convert it to bare ground because it's more valuable, it's more valuable without the forest than it is um, with. Versus potential mechanisms to offset carbon emissions by protecting the carbon that's stored in tropical forests. So red um, is reduced emissions from deforestation degradation and enhancements, um, is one of the primary mechanisms to protect tropical forests for their carbon value. Now all of this is is hugely coming into question in the context of the new president of Brazil, Bolsonaro, who um, does not have an environment, environmental mandate. And so there's a lot of big questions about how development is going to proceed and if there are going to be incentives or structures in place to protect those forest systems. This is a picture of a deforestation fire that's essentially pr um, creating its own pyrocumulus clouds and then um, precipitating black rain. So the moisture content in those forests released through fire 
that air mass cools, condenses, and then precipitates downwind the precipitation, the moisture content that used to be in that forest. This is just one image from one deforestation fire. You can imagine that this has huge consequences across very large spatial scales. And there are really important feedbacks that we should be taking into account when we think about the relationship be between fire and, and drought and fire and emissions. And so the question is, what kind of cycle can you get into um, between fire actually creating positive feedbacks that are feeding back to the probability of increased drought? And there are three major ones. So one of them is um, fire kills trees, especially in systems that don't have very many adaptations, um, in species that don't have very many adaptations to fire. You kill trees and you essentially reduce evapotranspiration back to the atmosphere. About a third of the rainfall that falls in the Amazon is linked to the evapotranspiration rates of the forest themselves. So you can reduce precip, essentially regional precip, through this mechanism. Another one is through smoke. So fire creates smoke, but those smoke particulates hold on to water molecules and inhibit rainfall, um, also at regional scales. Fire releases a lot of carbon. It releases a lot of carbon, which also on global scales, those emissions can contribute to warming and promoting drought also. So one of the um, areas of research I've worked in is actually trying to document this feedback here, the fire carbon connection, particularly for deforestation fires that are very much outside the historical range of what any kind of natural fire frequency may have been. And so to capture that, um, I led a team of fire scientists with David Bowman at the University of Tasmania to look at can we quantify the fire contribution to radiative forcing? And so we took each of these radiative forcing elements from the IPCC group and looked at whether or not we could, we could calculate the contribution from deforestation fires. And so we went through CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and all the other elements, and the, the boxes that are colored are essentially that contribution. And the upshot is that deforestation fires contribute up to a fifth of anthropogenic warming since pre-industrial times. And so this is the contribution of fire to the Earth system when it's out of whack with natural variability. And it can essentially change the Amazon forest system from a sink to a source. And so if you have really, really strong drought and fire years in the Amazon, you're essentially losing the potential for that Amazon forest to suck up carbon dioxide and store it for later. And this was a commentary that I was asked to write based on um, uh, a system of flights that were capturing the emissions from these fire events over the Amazon during a couple of cold seasons. But there's something missing from this story, which is I'm talking all about intentional land use so far. And what deforestation fires are doing, there's also a really important knock-on effect of what's going on with understory wildfires? So those intentional forest fires are actually translating into unintended wildfires that escape into nearby forests. And under drought years, they can move through large tracts of, of otherwise intact forest systems. And so just to give you an example, during the 97-98 El Nino event, there was 39,000 square kilometers of otherwise intact forest that burned in the Amazon. Um, this is like the size of multiple states in the U.S. where the petagrams of carbon was about 0.3, estimated 0.3 to 0.6 petagrams of carbon can be released. It can be much higher in, say, tropical Indonesian peat forests where you have lots of carbon stored in peat and you can have huge fluxes of CO and CO2 to the atmosphere. So this was the beginning of my Ph.D. was trying to understand um, understory wildfires in the Amazon and their effects um, on tropical forests. So this guy is Blairo Maggi. He is um, currently the minister, one of the ministers under the new regime. He's former governor of the state of Mato Grosso. Um, he was given Greenpeace's Golden Chainsaw Award. He and his family are one of the largest soy producers in the world. And I ended up working on one of his ranches 
um, as part of my PhD in this tiny little forest plot on a ranch that's about 80,000 hectares in size. It takes about an hour to drive from end to end. Um, and Brazil has incredibly progressive environmental legislation. So as a landowner, he's expected to keep half of his land as forest, which he does. But the question that I was trying to help answer was, okay, so you are protecting these forests because you want to be legal on a, on a green soy market. Um, or you just want to be legal so that you can get a better price for your soy. But what would happen if a forest fire came through your forest system on this massive um, private land holding? So that's some of the context for the work that I was doing. Um, and I produced some of the first estimates of what the actual carbon consequences were of these understory wildfires both in terms of the amount of dead biomass that was combusted, and I'm not gonna make you memorize these numbers, don't worry about it, but um, quantifying the amount of carbon combusted, but then also the killed biomass. So we went in and did intensive pre and post fire measurements to get at these numbers and then monitored trees over time. Um, and the upshot is if carbon was selling for $5 a ton on a carbon market, which is pretty conservative, um, and a forest fire went through his ranch, he would lose about $16 million in, in carbon credits. So that's why this private lander owner would potentially care about wildfires on his property. Okay, so that was like one take on the relationship between fire and the carbon system um, relating back to emissions. I'm also gonna talk about fuels and how people change fuels. So we fragment and we farm, we suppress fires, and we also introduce invasive species. And all of these things can change the fuels that are available to burn. And I'm gonna focus in on this last one and two different case studies where I've seen um, the fire invasive grass fire cycle take hold. Um, so one is in the, at this field site in the Amazon. So this is Fazenda Tanguro, that same ranch um, at the southern edge of the Amazon basin between um, the white is the Brazilian Cejado or Savannah. Um, the green is a forest system. And then what's already been deforested is um, in yellow. So it's right in the heart of, of transition. It's right in the heart of the frontier. And it's also at an ecotonal boundary between Amazon tropical rainforest and Brazilian Savannah. The experimental burn design is um, we have 50 hectare plots where we um, have a control that we didn't burn. We have a plot that we burned on uh, every three years and then a plot that we burned every year. And this experiment started in 2004. Um, a couple years into my PhD program, I was lucky enough to, to work at this system and uh, we've now monitored it since then. So it's an um, incredibly expensive and long-term experiment to try and understand forest dynamics and how they're changing. Uh, it's one of the largest experimental burns um, in the tropics. So just to give you a sense of scale, um, this is how big that forest plot system is. Um, and it, it takes um, a huge team to pull off this type of burn experiment. We um, sampled over 10,000 stems in this forest plot system, all the way from like tiny little tree saplings to the giant trees to understand um, how different size classes are also responding. We set fire lines um, in these plots, about 10 kilometers of kerosene um, fuel mix. Um, it takes us about a week to pull off one of these experimental burns. It takes about 50 people. So we rake to bare soil um, all of the fuels around this entire plot system um, in order to prevent escaped fires. And they're surface fires, so the fact that I'm like comfortable walking in and around this is also indicative of the type of fire behavior. I would not be doing this in the western US. Um, <laughs> and fires are slow moving, generally speaking, and low intensity, um, which has very interesting consequences for trees. This is a picture of the first experimental burn we set and the smoke that came off of this. The hash lines are um, where we had a trail network built in. So we had 80 kilometers of trail that we cut into this forest in order to understand um, and access all those trees. And we happened to be burning 
um, during the 2007 drought when um, we were burning at 110 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which probably in retrospect was not a great idea. Um, but it was an incredible opportunity to understand the consequence of increased drought and temperature on fire behavior in this forest system. And so during that year, um, so cumulative water deficit, it's a measure of drought intensity, um, dropped significantly during that um, time frame across the region. And we also saw a companion increase, at least detected by Landsat, um, we saw a spike in the amount of burned area regionally. So what we were seeing on the, it, at the local scale was also going on regionally. Um, and it's important also to think about there's a drought gradient in the Amazon. It's not just all one forest type. It's not all one climate type. The southeast experiences a four to five month dry season, whereas the northwestern sites or, or region of the Amazon experiences a much shorter drought frequency and length. Um, and this is important in trying to understand response. At our local field site, we essentially saw a three degree Celsius increase in temperature during that particular year. This is that drought year, so much higher temperature. Humidity levels were much lower. And we also saw an increase in fine fuels. So about a third more um, fine fuel mass, and that's essentially what this is showing here, drought years non-drought years and the biomass that we measured in the field um, in both of those burn plots. So it looks complicated, but essentially the, the gist is that we saw more fine fuels and it was hotter. And then we saw this transition point in the response of trees. We saw a, a, almost a 60% mortality, cumulative mortality measured in post-2007 fires. Um, compared to the control, so this is the control. So the plot that burned every year is this set of triangles. So we saw not as high of an increased mortality rate in the plot that burned more frequently, counterintuitive. We actually saw the highest mortality in the plot that we burned less frequently or every three years. So timing matters. This is the upshot of this, is that timing matters in terms of disturbance intervals. Um, trees take a while to die. They take a while to shed their leaves or their branches and actually create more fuels on the ground. And so what we were creating was actually a prescribed fire scenario with the annual burn. We were mo removing fuels fast enough that we were actually reducing future fire intensity. And in the plot that we burned every three years, it happened to be like the perfect time interval between when you first killed a tree and when it gets tired of holding on to its biomass, it releases it, it dies, it falls over, and then becomes fuel for a more intense future fire. With really high tree mortality, particularly at the edges, we then started to see grass invasion. This was a forest system where we didn't see any grasses in the interior forest to something like this several years into this frequent burning regime. And this fire intensity is at least five times greater than what we were seeing in the understory, these slow, cool, moving surface fires. This is a digital globe image of the fires. Um, a decade into the experiment where this is the plot that burned every three years, this is the plot that burned every year. And you can even visually see the difference in that the intensity and the response was much stronger in the plot that burned every three years. Leaf area index, which is a metric of canopy cover and closure, um, was much higher in the control plot and about the same in the two burn plots. And we lost a lot of biomass. So measuring all those trees enabled us to understand how much biomass was being killed off. We lost about 60 tons per hectare um, across this forest system um, based on whether it, it burned once, um, burned on an annual basis, or burned every three years. So if I had to capture the whole experiment, a decade of my work, it would be this graph, which I'll walk through. Um, and these variables are all related to one another. So here is edge distance. So this is the forest edge. This is the interior of the forest system. And let's start with LAI. So LAI is a measure of canopy cover. 
in the control plot, so the control plot is green, the annually burned plot is blue, and the burn plot that was burned every three years was, is in uh, red. And so you have much higher canopy cover in the control plot, um, and then it's, it's much lower at the, forest edge, at the forest edge compared to the interior in those two burn plots. That influences vapor pressure in the understory. So vapor pressure deficit then responds to canopy cover. And that's important because vapor pressure deficit is a measure of how hot and dry it is. And that essentially relates to some of the other variables. So vapor pressure is much, vapor pressure deficit is much higher um, in the plot that, the plots that burned. There's increased solar radiation in the surface of the, the forest, making things drier and hotter. And that ultimately changed flame heights. So we had a much higher um, and more intense fire at the edge of this forest system than we did in the interior. And that also led to much higher cumulative mortality in the burn plots compared to the control, um, and that also at the edge versus the interior of the forest system. You kill off trees, you create space for grass invasion. We had virtually no grass, grass invasion in the control plot versus a very high amount of grass cover in the plots that burned, um, either on an annual basis or on a triannual basis. We were crazy enough to go out and map, like on a meter by meter basis, the spatial distribution of these grasses in these plots. Um, and this is the control plot from zero to about 250 meters. So this is pasture or soy, which got converted during this time period. And like here is the interior forest system. So we had grass invasion in both of the burn plots, but it was also different. So we were also noticing that fire frequency was determining species composition in the new invaded grassland system that was starting to emerge. This is dominated by one single species versus we had this mix of different species that were coming in. These are all grass species, C3, C4, and native and non-native. So creating this really novel grassland system in response to different fire frequencies. And the upshot of my PhD, essentially these two images, you can go from Amazon forest to this novel grassland via fire in less than a decade. So going from something like this, from closed canopy forest to a really different system. And one of the key questions now is how persistent is this? Is this a, is this a state change or is this something that we're gonna see recovery of over time? So NSF, I just need another 15 years of funding to do that, <laughs> or 30. Um, and why this matters is because 10% of the Shingu Basin, so this one of the major watersheds within the Amazon Basin, are less than 100 meters from the forest edge. So given the land use and the spatial distribution of land use, different land uses, we're expose, exposing a lot of edges to um, grass prop propagules. Um, and also the increased drier conditions and ignition sources. That's not the only place I've seen that story play out. We're seeing invasive grasses in other parts of the world too. Um, so I've also worked on this system, which is Northern Nevada, Great Basin area, um, looking at cheatgrass, which is a non-native grass species that essentially creates a carpet of fuels. Um, and it's a very different fuel structure than native shrubland vegetation. And so what you're seeing on the left is an image that captures that kind of carpet of fuel um, with the lighter yellow golden colored cheatgrass. And then what happened just afterwards, um, my grad student Adam, I'm not sure why he happens to be in places that are burning, um, but he was able to take these two images, one before and one after um, this fire. And what, you, what you're seeing is essentially that carpet of fuel creates a sustained fire progression um, that makes it very hard for sagebrush to recover from this type of fire event. Looking at this on very large regional scales, um, this is one of the first um, documented uses of satellite imagery to, to get at one individual species. So we were able to class out cheatgrass because it dries out before any native vegetation type. And so we can see that color change and seasonal change in the satellite imagery. 
So that map is the red area here. It covers about 40,000 square kilometers of area in the Great Basin. This is, um, now we're in the US. So all I did here was match that spatial map and distribution of cheatgrass with the MODIS fire record from 2000 and 2009 and see if we were seeing major regional changes. And the upshot is that cheatgrass burns twice as much. Um, so the percent that burned in that time period for cheatgrass is this bar here, about 12% burned, um, which drastically reduces the fire return interval in this system compared to any native vegetation type. And this is an example of what I call one of the largest fires you've never heard of. And the reason is because nobody lives here. This is northern Nevada. There might be a few ranching communities around here, but this never made it to the news this year. Um, this was a 430,000 acre fire event that essentially blew through a cheatgrass dominated area. And so that continuous carpet of fuel is increasing the, the frequency of fire, but it's also implicated in the large fires. So 50 out of the 50 largest fire events that happened during that same time period from 2000 to 2009, um, 40 of them had cheatgrass present. This, fi this fire also started here on July 5th at 1 a.m. Very likely a human started fire related to fireworks. It's still under investigation. So I'm gonna to get to that in, the, in a bit, but I just wanted to point that out. This is a fire that happened over three days too. This, I mean, huge acreage because you've got very fine fuels that are super dry. So what are the consequences of some of these types of fire events and cheatgrass invasion? That's also something um, we've worked on, just had a paper come out in Ecosphere where we um, created a fire history atlas. What we did was we piled on all of the satellite data across a 40 year record to see, okay, what's the max fire frequency that we're seeing in this record that's kind of the gradation of grays is more and more fires. And then we use that to define a, a sampling strategy. So we then went into the field based on that reconstructed fire history from satellites to understand how is species composition changing as a function of increasing fire frequency. Um, so these dots are where we then sampled within that, that spatial um, overlay of fire fre frequency. Um, and this is the number of sites and the species richness curves for zero, one, two, and three fires. And essentially what this is showing, very simple but elegant representation of fire frequency, or species composition, species richness declines as a function of increasing fire frequency. And the nice thing about this is that we, this, the satellite data actually enabled us to develop this um, to test over longer time periods than would have been possible if I had gone out and set those fires myself. So I spent a decade setting fires in the Amazon, and frankly, I got a little tired of it. <laughs> um, understanding 150 hectares, I wanted to scale my questions. I wanted to understand what was happening at larger regional scales. I had very fine scale information. I really wanted to scale up. And so this was one of the first, my work on cheatgrass was really one of the first attempts at using satellite imagery to save me the pain of traveling three days to my field site location. <laughs> Okay, ingredient number three, ignitions. Wildfires are not so wild. That's the upshot here. That people are really playing a substantial role in changing the spatial and temporal distribution of ignitions. In fact, in the US, over two decades, we started 84% of our wildfires. So this image is built off of a data set of 1.5 million government records of wildfire where Every event that requires some sort of suppression response um, requires the government to report on it in some way. And they have to report cause. So they actually have to go in and do cause determination um, in order to understand if it was human or lightning started. And so that's the database that this was built off. That's the, yeah, that's the database that this is built off of. The color represents human ignition. So higher um, percentages are represented by oranges and reds um, and lower um, percentages or more lightning dominated fire regimes are represented by blues. And then the size of the dot 
corresponds to the number of events that were recorded over this time period. So what you're seeing here is a huge influence of people on the spatial distribution of fire based on their ignitions. Not surprisingly, you see very strong signal of eastern US dominated human fire regimes, but also coastal areas. Um, so the California, Oregon, Washington coastal areas are experiencing a high number of human ignitions and human started fires. And it's really only the Intermountain West that still has kind of a preserved lightning ignition signal. And part of that is mountains are magnets for lightning. Um, and so you have high lightning density in these places, but also they're not as populated or don't have as much exposure uh, to people. You can dig into the cause information and there's lots more to be done there. Um, burning of trash and debris <coughs> is one of the biggest causes, mostly southeastern dominated in that signal. Um, other or unknown human causes, arson, heavy equipment, campfires, children, smokers, those are some of the main dominant causes and it varies by region. Um, as well. I've looked at the flip side of this question, which is what's the lightning strike density? So this is a, the map on the left is um, density of dry lightning and then the percent of that that's actually occurring as dry lightning between May and October on the right. Um, you can look at either of these and what I really want to point out here is this white area along the coastal regions is not missing data. It's that the lightning climatology is such that you very, have very few lightning strikes west of the Sierras. And so the door is actually pretty open for people to be providing the ignition sources to be starting the fires that happen along the coasts. There's a very important seasonality distribution to this. On the left is the human started fires and then when they're happening across the season. And on the right is the dominant lightning ignition signal. And so lightning is really a summertime phenomenon, whereas people are distributing ignitions throughout the year. We can also plot this based on the year, or the day of the, the, day of the year. This is January 1st. This is December 31st, Julian Day. This is the number of fire events, human and lightning, lightning and blue. Anybody tell me what this day is? Fourth of July. 7,000 wildfires happened over this two decade period on July 4th. So there's a cultural imprint here that's really, really prominent. This very, that's national scale, it varies by ecoregion. Some of the strongest human signal is in Mediterranean California versus the temperate Syrias where you still have the, the lightning associated fire regimes really dominant in those systems. But really important, you've got this seasonal shift. Essentially, people are providing ignitions that are starting fires in the shoulder seasons in the spring and in the fall. And that has really important consequences for vegetation response because those fires are different. They're happening under moister and cooler conditions. This data set has not been explored as much as, much as it could be or should be. You see really interesting spatial patterns. So this is a road network. Essentially human dominated ignitions are happening near roads in some locations. This is the front, front range in, in Colorado from Fort, um, Colorado Springs all the way up to Fort Collins. How people are recreating in landscapes is also providing ignitions. And then you do see ecotonal boundaries as well based on where people are living and what they're doing in that landscape. Um, what we tried to show in this paper is that people are really shifting the fire niche. So thinking about fire as a species, like under what environmental conditions is that species occurring is something we applied, that thinking we applied to fire. And so this is um, a thousand hour fuel moisture. It's an integrator of fuel um, moisture for the very large fuels. Um, it integrates months of climatological information um, plotted against the lightning strikes that happened um, in a given, um, at a given fire. And what you're seeing here is what I call the expansion of the fire niche. So lightning started fires, not surprisingly, happen when there's lots of lightning strikes and they're also happening under very low moisture conditions versus human started fires are essentially all over the place. Because we're starting fires in the fall and the spring and under very, or much cooler and moisture conditions, we're changing the space that fire is occupying in terms of its niche. Okay. Just a few words about the fire data revolution. 
it's really enabling me and my colleagues to ask questions about what are the large scale causes and consequences of changing fire, not only today, but can we also use the data that we have to predict out and understand fire in the future? And this is the key question that my career has kind of migrated to because I get asked this question all the time. How is fire changing? What is it gonna look like in, in 15 years? And are we gonna be able to coexist? How can we coexist with changing fire? There are over a dozen satellites capturing information about fire and its effects, and we've published on how that, how that data from different sensors is different. And, we, and ultimately, it's actually pretty different what you're seeing from MODIS versus what you're seeing from Landsat versus what you get from the government records. And it's really, we need, in, or, in order to understand fire, we need to build a, a fuller picture of it. And the way that we can do that is actually integrating across these different sources of information. And one way that we're doing that is actually deriving techniques to start building those data sets together and start doing kind of the process of data harmonization. And so deriving events is key. So the MODIS, um, MODIS burned area product just gives you a burn date based on pixel. It doesn't actually reconstruct events for you, but you need events in order to understand the spatial and temporal distribution um, and how those events are occurring. So we've developed an algorithm that essentially clusters pixels in space and time in order to derive events. This is an, an example of that. What we've done is on the left, um, where we've been able to construct this fire event from the space-time properties in MODIS um, to see how the progression of that event happened over time. And then we've essentially looked at thousands and thousands of other events that have been reconstructed. This is based on essentially GPS in the field of the actual day in which that fire was detected by suppression teams. And the correlation is pretty remarkable, which is great, it gives me great hope that what we're doing is good. Um, but now we can scale. Now we can scale understanding across the event level to understand how fire regimes are changing. And we can also pile all of this data together to say, okay, what, what do US pyromes look like? So this colored image is essentially five major different pyromes. Um, the smallest human impact, the most extreme characteristics are these pockets of yellow. Um, the highest human impact are these orange areas that are also moderate fire characteristics. And one thing I want to point out here is that the pyromes don't actually match the ecoregions. So the black lines are the ecoregion delineations. So you've actually got pyromes or fire behavior characteristics in California that are more similar to what's going on in the southeastern US. So it helps us really understand what is the fire regime characteristic today and how is that changing. We can also pile all that information together to understand and predict extreme events in the US. So um, the only thing you need to take away here is that um, these red lines are predictions of extreme events and then the observed data that we have is the black dots across different ecoregions. This is maximum fire size over the last five years. We preserved the record before 2010 in order to derive this prediction space um, using spatiotemporal, um, a spatiotemporal Bayesian framework, modeled five different distributions for extremes to understand which one fit best for both fire size and for fire frequency. And the takeaway here is that we're actually living with the probability of million acre fire events in the US, but we haven't actually seen them yet. So the observed record that we're seeing, the biggest fire is 450, 500,000 acres in the lower 48. But we're actually living with the probability right now of a million acre fire event. So we're, it's not surprising, given these results, the size of events that we're seeing today. There's also a lot of new sources of information about fire. So we're collecting tweets around emergencies and disasters. And we now have millions of tweets around fire events, wildfire events that have happened over the last couple years. And we're looking at how do we extract information about those events? How do we identify people who need help um, in those times of disaster? The ICS-209 reporting system, so publicly available data based on incident reports from wildfires and suppression response, 
publicly available does not mean easy to use data. So we've spent the last couple years developing an open accessible protocol for integrating all this data and using pretty complex natural language processing techniques to extract additional information from the messiness of human reported text. Um, to drones, so we're also looking at using um, LIDAR based sensors and multispectral cameras in order to get at individual tree level representations in a post fire disturbance environment up at um, Nahuatl Ridge, which is Southern Rockies. And one specific example is we've matched Zillow data um, with the fire record from satellites. So we have a partnership with Zillow. We have access to 200 million housing records. And we've delineated the fire perimeters over the last um, roughly two decades in order to understand what's the threat. What is the actual threat that we've seen within observed fire perimeters based on very, these dots of very fine resolution footprints of individual homes. This paper is um, in review right now at Science Advances and essentially three million homes were within wildfire perimeters over this time period, which is at least five times greater than our known threat, which is based on census data. The most current is 2010. We have no knowledge of our threat of what we've experienced over the last eight years. And so this work is really improving our ability to understand, understand that threat. And why am I crazy enough to run two centers? So here's how I think about it. It's trying to leverage the data revolution to increase our ability to create insight and new discoveries that ultimately are helping with decisions. And so Earth Lab and the Climate Adaptation Science Center I see is kind of a spectrum of um, and an interrelationship between discovery and decisions and how we can make the world a better place um, by using the power of the science and the knowledge that we have. The North Central a Adaptation Center, it's one of eight regional centers focused on resource management challenges in the face of a chi changing climate in the North Central region. Um, is this one right here. And then Earth Lab is focused on accelerating science, helping students and postdocs and re researchers get over data pain. Um, I've got an analytics, dedicated analytics hub staff um, and also dedicated education staff um, building a new program in earth analytics education. Right, it's a $2 million a year operation. I've got nine, nine full-time staff who are helping me build this program, but essentially it's doing just that, trying to help get rid of your data pain, help you do the science and answer the questions that you couldn't have otherwise, and then helping students to learn the data skills that they need. And you can check out what we're doing. We have a pretty strong ethic around open science, making data, code, workflows open and accessible. Um, we also make our education materials open and accessible. So earthdatascience.org, we've put up 250 training modules. You can learn anything from how to use LiDAR data to how to tap into Twitter's API. We currently get 35,000 unique users a month to this site indicating the huge demand for these skills. A big thanks to all my collaborators, staff, students, postdocs. Um, this work that I presented today is really a reflection of large team science efforts. Um, and also a number of funding agencies, diversity of groups who have been lucky um, and fortunate enough to um, have their support. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. So thank you. Time for a couple questions, and then I need to make sure to wrap it up by one, right? Yeah. Any questions? Just a, a clarification question from the start of your talk. Um, the 20% of warming that's due to, I think you called them deforestation fires, that doesn't include places like Southern Africa that are fire maintained ecosystems and are meant to burn? No, no, yeah. We were really careful to make sure, even though I also think that that's changing. We need to get a better handle on how fire regimes are shifting across systems that do have fire adaptations and have evolved with very high frequency fire events. Yeah, good question. Uh, 
What is it about cheatgrass that makes it so much more flammable than other types of vegetation? Yeah, that's a great question. So it is, um, it's a winter annual, so it, it takes advantage of the winter pulse of precipitation. It grows really fast and then it dries out sooner than everything else. So that's one thing. So it's like, hey, it's April and I'm flammable. Um, and then the other thing is it has really thin leaves and so it's really ignitable. Yeah. And it grows in large clumps that creates fuel continuity. Okay. Uh, yeah, happy to step out and answer other questions. Oh, thank you. Yeah.